स्थापकाय च धर्म सेवधर्म से अवतार वरिष्ठा रामकृष्णा नम So when we were discussing different aspects of Ramanuja's philosophy, I already mentioned earlier, Ramanuja's system also is a, is a kind of Advaita, but different from uh, the Advaita of Shankaracharya. So Ramanuja's Advaita is sometimes called Visistha Advaita, and he establishes his Advaita or unity of existence on the basis of the special feature called the visistha ikyam means unity which is conditioned that's the literal that's a possible literal translation of visistha ikyam in contrast to shankaracharya who calls it swarupa ikyam which is essentially by its very nature by its very pristine nature which is uh, one based on the idea of uni- unity of existence and reality now how does ramanuja establish this in shankara system which we already discussed earlier the unity is achieved based on this idea that what we see as plurality is there but it is, but uh, at the end of the day you understand it is only a mental projection well i can give many examples the example of uh, the the rope and snake is one but maybe a much more clearer example is uh, see suppose we we see in front of us uh, different uh, different uh, dishes different cups and saucers and jars and glass i mean they say let's say containers made of clay now uh, it will be ridiculous for anyone to say that all these are the same obviously anyone uh, anyone will understand that a, a cup made of clay is different from a jar made of clay it's totally different so there is really apparently on the face of it you can't see any unity you can't say that cup is the same as the jar but then when you look at uh, well what is it made of the the cup or the pot is made of clay and the jar also is made of clay and like that there may be this plurality of existence nama and rupa different forms and different names infinite number and infinite in the variety forms now when you when you focus on the difference in terms of forms and names then there can be no unity but if you focus on the essence the essential thing out of which these different pots and pans are made then obviously everything is clear now ramanuja and madhva and other non advaitic philosophers will tell you that their differences in terms of its utility uh, makes it a, a real difference i can make it clear a cup made of pot may be used for drinking water a jar made of clay may be used for storing water a huge vessel made of clay can be use for let's say for storing grains so there is a great difference in terms of utility and you call them by different names that's because they have different forms so that makes it totally different now shankaracharya says this difference is of a relative nature impermanent not absolutely not is an absolute nature because if you break them all they all go back to clay and then uh, before they were made they were all clay so when they are standing in front of you as different pots and pans names and forms then also they are clay so actually there was no pot apart from clay you remove all the clay from the pot 
the pot is gone. He removed all the gold from different golden ornaments. The ornaments are gone. The gold is there. Now, it is called Vyavaharika. Vyavaharika Buddhi means uh, difference in terms of the practical utility. Now, Ramanuja, Madhva and all other non-Advedic Vedantins will tell you that this practical utility value is of a permanent nature. So that means, according to, according to Madhvacharya, the difference even goes beyond that. He says, a, a cup made of clay is fundamentally different from a pot made of clay. Because you don't drink water with a pot. For that you need a cup. So that makes it a totally different thing. So according to equal Panchabheda Siddhanta, to understand Advaita of Shankaracharya, Vishita Advaita of of Ramanuja, you can see Dvaita of Madhvacharya, Panchabheda Siddhanta. Everything in this phenomenal world is different from each other. And God is f a, a different from everything in this world. And every living being is different from every other living being. And every living being is different from every other non-living beings. And every uh, non-living being is different from God. So the Pancha Bheda Siddhanta. If you got a triangle, you can think of five possible distinct, I mean, distinctions. So everything is different from everything else. That means a golden ornament, a golden ring is essentially, fundamentally, completely, absolutely different from a golden watch. But Shankara will tell you, all right, utility is there, you don't, you, you can't use a, uh, a golden ring, you can't, you have to put it uh, maybe in your ears, but you can't use it as a, as a ring to wear, to wear in your hands. You can use it as a necklace to wear in your neck. But Shankaracharya will tell you, Advaita will tell you, well, there is difference, but that difference is only secondary, not primary difference. That kind of distinction, that would be Vyavaharika Paramarthika, difference in a di difference which is only relative, that means uh, distinction based on relativity and the non distinction from an absolute point of view, these ideas are not fundamentally accepted by any of the non Advaitin. Vedantis. This is a fundamental difference. So, so, in fact, that's why it is called Aprutak Siddhi. This particular unity or Vishishtaikyam that Ramanuja calls it, it is established through this an interesting uh, uh, philosophical doctrine. It is called Aprutak Siddhi. Prutak means distinct. Aprutak means non-distinct. All jivas are different in uh, different uh, 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 phenomenal objects. They are non-different from God, but then they are not the same. That's it. So, they, there is a dependence. Jivas, that is souls, individual souls, and Jagat, the phenomenal world, and different objects in the phenomenal world, they are dependent upon God. They are evolutes of God. That is, Parinama Siddhanta is accepted by Ramanuja. Not in the same way in which Sankhyas and Yoga philosophers accept Parinama. It is Prakriti Parinama, but Ramanuja's view is Brahma Parinama. So, or called, you may call it Ishwara Parinama. God transforms, it is a permanent transformation, into Jivas and Jagat, different individual souls and the phenomenal world. Transformation, Parinama. In Sankhya system, in Yoga system, because Yoga philosophers follow the views of Sankhya. Sankhya is the original philosophical aspect of Yoga philosophers. They believe Prakriti Parinama. From matter, everything evolves. But in, in Ramanuja's Vedanta, from God, from Sima Narayana, everything evolves. It is called Brahman. His concept of Brahman is Sima Narayana. Or the, Saguna Sakara Ishara. So he establishes this idea of unity on the basis of special Aprutak Siddhi. That is, everything in this world and all jivas are dependent upon God. 
God is independent. And of course, uh, this is this is sometimes explained the relation between Brahman, that is Siman Narayana or Sagura Brahman, and Chit and Achit, Jivas, Chit and Achit, this Prakriti, the phenomenal world. He calls it Sharira, Sharirin, Prakara, Prakarin, Athara, Atheya. Three terms that he uses this uh, in his system. Sharira, Shariri means, for example, Sharira is body. Sharirin is the one who has got this body. In other words, he, God is the one who possesses this body. What is this body? This Jiva Jagat. That means this all the individual souls, the entire creation, living beings, and also the non-living phenomenal world and all the various objects. They together constitute the body of Ishara. And Ishara is the one who has this body, Sharirin is called. So Prakara, Prakarin. Prakara means mode. So Jiva and Jagat, Chit and Achit, different individual souls and the phenomenal world. They constitute Prakara, means mode. And, praka, uh, and Prakarin is the one who, is the, who, who has this mode, the possessor of this mode. Athara and Atheya. Athara is Brahman, God. It is the support, the base. Atheya is something that, that, that is sustained by Athara. See, for example, a, a pot is Athara. The water in that pot is Atheya. So that makes it all the more clear. Brahman or God is independent. Everything else is dependent. They exist because of God, because of Siman Narayana. Something called Vishnu, Narayana, and all that. Vaikuntha Gadyam is there. So the Vishnu is identified to Sriman Narayana. Now, there is a little bit of interesting dialectical difference between these two views. That's a very interesting. I mentioned earlier uh, the two views of uh, Ramanujaids on the one hand, and that view is in a different way, with slight difference. Uh, accepted, uh, followed by Sankhyas and Yogas. Of course, they're much more, much older than Ramanuja system. And that one hand and Shankaracharya system. Shankaracharya says, this Brahman becoming this world is only a matter of transfiguration, not transformation. It is not like the oil seeds becoming oil. It is rather like gold becoming golden rings, golden cups, golden necklaces, and so on. Or rather clay becoming clay pots, pans, jars, and other things, other, uh, other vessels made of clay. As I mentioned, you remove all the clay from all the clay pots and jars all made of clay, there will be no jars, there will be no pots, there will be only clay. Because clay pot cannot stand independent of clay. But that dependency is not like the dependence of Jiva and Jagat depending upon God. Rather, essentially, it is the same. So, a transformation, which is not real, is called a kind of, uh, 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 it is transfiguration, rather, we think that the clay has become permanently, the clay has become uh, the clay pot, the clay pot cannot go back to the clay, that is an error, that is adhyasa. That is a misunderstanding, just as you mistake the rope 
for a snake. But as you evolve further in your spiritual life, you suddenly realize that after all, this transformation is only apparent. That's what Advaitins will tell you. And this apparent transformation is called Vivarta. Vivartavada means this approach that this transformation of Brahman into Jagat and Jiva is only apparent transformation, not real transformation. But Ramanuja will tell you it is a real transformation. Sankhyas also will tell you it is a real transformation. But this real transformation, oil is becoming oil. Oil cannot go back to oil seeds. But clay pots can go back to clay. Golden rings and necklaces can go back to gold. That's why there's a famous statement. These are the gems of Vedanta philosophy. Unless you understand this, we won't get a real handle on Vedanta. People who don't have access to these, Every day you read books and articles that will tell you if Ramanuja can mistake, a mist, make a mistake, why not modern scholars, Indians? Indian, in India also there are so many writers, more, especially modern writers. They will tell you, Shankaracharya says, I am not here, you are not here, we are not speaking. There is no electricity now and there is no mic system now. The table is not in front of me. Swami Vedanta is sitting in front of me, listening to He is not sitting there. That's what Vedanta tells us. That is absolute gibberish. So, to make this point clear, there is a quotation. It is from Sarvaknyatma Muni. He is a poor Shankarita Dvedins. He wrote a well-known book, Samkshepa Sarirakam. He says, Vivartha Vadasya Purabhumi Vedanta Vade Parinama Vadeha Vivasthi Desbin Parinama Vade Soyam Samayadi Vivartha Vadeha so, Vivartha Vadasya Purabhumi Vedanta Vade Parinama Vadeha Vivasthi Desbin Parinama Vade Soyam Samayadi Vivartha Vadeha So, well, the first stage with prima facie view, so to speak, of Vivartha Vada is that we all think actually that the threads have become the cloth, the clay has become clay pot, the gold has become golden ring, has really become, means our capital. That is the first understanding. I mean, uh, there are two levels of understanding. The first understanding is really prima facie understanding. It is not exactly, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really tally exactly with the, la the meaning of Latin expression or the meaning in which it is used in the law of court. But that's the Pura Paksha, means the, pur the first uh, uh, apparent, the first superficial understanding, which actually is to be corrected. Now, so Pura Bhumi, so Vivartha Vadasya Pura Bhumi, Vedanta Vade Parinama Vadaha. So, in our, in our spiritual evolution, first we think the thread has actually become the cloth, the gold has actually become golden ring, etc. Means it cannot go back to gold. When, but then gradually, as we evolve further, then you understand, well, actually, this transformation is not a permanent transformation. Why? Because if you if you melt this golden ring, golden necklace, all, then it goes back to gold only. The same gold from which it is made. Again, the cloth. You remove all the threads. They go back to thread formation. So, the transformation of threads into cloth, tandu pada, is a term used in Vedantic language. That transformation is only apparent, but that's the second level of understanding, the more accurate level of understanding. And so it's a matter of spiritual evolution. So Shankaracharya uses the word Adhyasa and Maya etc. But Ramanujacharya doesn't accept the idea of dividing reality into the absolute reality the Vyavakarika empirical reality, the common sense experience, and also the conceptual reality, 
Ramanuja doesn't agree with Ramanuja. Say the world is there. We can see it is there. It is as real as Brahman itself. Shankaracharya will tell you, well, it is there, but it will not be there all the time. As you know, any physics, any student studying elementary physics will tell you, this world uh, was not what it is maybe some billions of years ago, and will not be what it is some billions of years later. The world is bound to change. So anything that changes is not absolutely real. It is not paramarthika. It is only vyavakarika. That also Ramanuja doesn't accept. Ram, you, you can find in Ramanuja's Bharsha, very interestingly, Ramanuja says, uh, you know, that Dvedin's view that what undergoes change and modification is not absolutely real, that cannot be accepted. But when, but the, trans, the translation, they will tell you, uh, Shankaracharya says, uh, what undergoes change is unreal. And Ramanuja says, what undergoes change cannot be called unreal. So on the face of it, you understand your Ramanuja is perfectly right. But what Shankaracharya means is, not absolutely real. What undergoes change is not absolutely real. Water becomes vapor. And again you can go back to water. Something changes from one to another status. So, it, the one the one form is not absolutely real in the sense it can change its form. It's what is subjected to modification. What undergoes change in the past, present and future. What undergoes change, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, birth, existence, growth, evolution, decay and death. Jayade, Asti, Vardhade, Piparinamade, Apakshide, Vinashchidi, six changes. Goes back to Yaskas Nirukta. Anything that, uh, that uh, under, undergoes change, like the Shashadvikara, six changes, cannot be absolutely real. But Shankaracharya never says it is absolutely unreal. Remember this very well. Advait is never tell us that this world is absolutely unreal. What the Advaitins tell us is this world only it is absolut not absolutely real but not absolutely unreal. It is real in the relative sense. That's the idea behind. So, and Ramanuja, of course, famous slogan is there, you know, Matta Paravarana Nikinjida Stidhananjaya Mai Sarvamidam Prodam Sutra Manigana Iva. That is a very beautiful sloka in the Gita, maybe in the seventh chapter it comes. Matta paradaram na anyan kinjidasti dhananjiya. Mai saramidam prodam sutre manigana iva. There is nothing apart from me, distinct from me, and everything is, is, is harmonized on me like pearls are uh, strung together in a, in a thread. Like that, I am the thread and all the, all the uh, varieties of names and forms, the entire uh, plurality of existence is just like pearls which are strung together in the thread. So this is a very, very important point. So the Ramanujas Bhashya says, Asesha Chit Achit Prakaram Brahmaiga meva tattum tatra prakara prakarinohu prakara namcha mitha atyanta bheti abhi vaisishtya di vivakshaya egutta vipateshaka tatitara nishetascha. So vaisishtya di vivakshaya egutta vipateshaka. That is Ramanujas. That is tatitara nishetascha. So he is trying to reject or refute the Advedin's view because Advedin's accept. Surupa, surupa ikyam, which is uh, which is not acceptable to Ramanuja. So he may be implying the Advaitin's view because Advaita became popular uh, uh, almost 350 years before Ramanuja. I remember uh, Ramanuja's own first guru, Yadava Prakasha. He was teaching Advaita, and uh, um, there is a very uh, disturbing statement in the Chandogya, the Dikapya Sampundari Gamishara, which is not so important to refer to. 
So uh, the guru was expounding it and Ramanuja started shedding tears. How can God's eyes be compared to uh, an animal's parts, etc. Uh, but then, so that is how it started. So what we have, one, one has to understand, Ramanuja's Advaita guru was Yadav Prakasha. And again, his, he has written something, some minor works, According to, and but they also do not reflect the real genuine Advaita philosophy of Adi Shankara. It is a distortion and a, it is a, a, a distraction from mainstream Advaita, which is what Ramanuja was listening to, which actually began the entire uh, uh, problem with Ramanuja, which eventually led to uh, led Ramanuja to uh, start this. Now, there is some, an, another important thing which I want to mention here. So, uh, that's again another important thing. Uh, there is one uh, well-known um, sutra in Brahma Sutras, which is frequently discussed as, of course, um, Brahma Sutra is a big book. Uh, it has got four chapters, uh, altogether 554 sutras. Uh, in some version, which is not... So just one view, 555, 554 sutras. The second sutra is frequently discussed in Ramanuja's book, Sibhashya, and also in the smaller book, Vedanta Deepa, which is called. So, the second sutra is Janmad Yasya Etaka. Janmad, Janmad Yasya Etaka. From what? From which? Janma, birth, etc., of this cosmos emerge. The implication is that reality, the supreme truth from which the world emerges, in which that world, this world exists, and towards which this world dissolves into. So, the focus of origin existence and dissolution of the universe. That is Brahman. So it actually is coming from Krishna Yajurveda, Taitiriya, Upanishad. But there is an important, very interesting episode where a little boy is asking his father to teach him the supreme spiritual truth, Brahma Vidya. It begins like this. Uh, Adhihi bhavo brimedi bhrugurvai varunihi varunam pidaram upasasara adhihi brimedi adhihi brimedi then uh, varuna the guru and father uh, teaches him yato vaimani bhudani jayande yena jatani jivandi yet prain debisam visandi tad vijijna saswa tad brahma this is the this is a famous very well known statement from the uh, Taitriya Upanishad. So the Adhihi Bhagavo Brahma Iti. Please teach me, O oh Lord, his own father and guru. The little boy asked. That, that's why. Bhrugu, that's the name of the boy. He goes to his father and teach, ask him, please teach me Brahma Vidya, the knowledge of Brahman. Adhihi Bhagavo Brahma Iti. And when the father heard this question, the father responds, Yetova imani bhudani jayande yena jatani jivandi yet prayin dabhisam bhisandi tad vijiknyasaswa da brahma. From what the entire world, all these living beings emerge, all the trees and mountains and valleys, sky and moon, everything. From what uh, they originate and where they exist and where they get dissolved. Realize that. Tad Brahma, Tad Brahma Vijiknya Saswa. That you should realize through meditation. And this is the instruction. And Bhrugu uh, went sat under a tree, meditated for a long time, 
then he thought annam brahmeti vijana anna deva imani bhutani jayanti annena jatani jeevanti annam prayanti bisam sandhi etc the first stage of realization spiritual evolution bhrugu thought after some time after some meditation he thought like a kindergarten boy thinking that learning alphabet is the greatest thing in education like this boy thought matter is the only thing that exists matter and he and literally means food that is prepared but here means matter so matter is the reality from which everything emerges in matter they all exist matter is the support of everything and matter is the point of dissolution of everything and father said no that's wrong again you should go and meditate and then after some time the little boy came back many years of meditation perhaps and said prana prana means the vital energy so because because annam pranam chakshu sutram etc they already mentioned earlier that's why this boy had this he thought he had already realized the supreme truth and the supreme truth there is matter and then he thought vital energy then he thought it is mind then he thought it is the intellect then also the father told him no you are not right. you are not right you are wrong you have to go ahead you have to go further you have to go meditate further you should inquire further and then the boy thought anandam meri vijanat anandam means absolute blissfulness so that's the, that's the last of his destination actually the reality also is beyond that so that's a different subject which comes in the taitiriya and it is called ananda mimamsa is a very elaborate subject maybe next time when some some other time we'll discuss this a separate topic I mean related to this of course so the point is based on that mantra that part of upanishad badarayana uh, made this sutra janmadhyasya takha so shankaracharya who wrote the first and the most apparently the most authentic brahma sutra bhashya he established that that supreme reality he is the origin the sustenance and also the point of dissolution but at the same time we cannot say that this birth uh, existence and dissolution that is janma sthiti laya they do not constitute a, a fundamental a complete a definition of brahman brahman cannot be defined the supreme reality cannot be defined it is vacham agocharam it is beyond the realm of words and the realm of mind but then with words with books we can certainly get an get an approximation of the supreme reality so that is his interpretation so according to shankaracharya words do not entirely define the supreme reality words can only give an indication is a remote indication tergul tadastha lakshana means satchidananda tadastha lakshana is a remote indication i mean from word to word emerges etc it's only a tadastha lakshana so uh, but ramanuja will tell you no it is a complete definition it is a complete definition now coming back to the subject we have to remember lakshana is an indication amounting to a definition sri so ramanuja will tell you this is a lakshana this is a complete definition complete indication a description of the supreme reality god as the creator is the highest definition of the supreme reality which even as we discussed earlier on many occasions even master eckhart rejected and master eckhart was the only theologian in christian tradition 
who had the courage, the intellectual logical courage to state that even defining God as a as just the creator of the world is a limitation which is not metaphysically acceptable. So if you define God, you are limiting God. So even even the Holy Trinity ideal is only an approximation. The reality goes even beyond that, which is of course not accepted in the mainstream church for which he was a Dominican priest. He was. But in Vedanta, in Shankara Vedanta, this is the fundamental principle. The supreme reality is something to be experienced as an immediate reality. And it is not something that can be explained. But any attempt to study books and texts and any description, any discussion of this subject will certainly be helpful to prepare our mind to eventually reach a point where we, where we realize the reality of Brahman. But the description doesn't equal to what it describes. That's why in the, to the end of the uh, Chadasutri Bhashya, Shankaracharya says, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, that Mahavakya statement, and Aham Brahmasmi, that Mahavakya experience, are two different levels. When you reach the experience, even the Mahavakya, the statement itself becomes uh, uh, irrelevant. You, you transcend the statement when you reach the experience dimension, when you reach the experience level of what you are stating. But Shankaracharya will, Shankara will tell you this, Etovaimani Bhudani Jayande Enajatani Jivandi etc. God is, or the Brahman is the origin, sustenance and the point of dissolution of this universe is only an indirect, incomplete indication. That is what Shankaraja will tell. But Ramanuja says, no, it is a full-flooded definition. Now, this indication, or generally indication can, can be twofold. One is, Visheshana, the other is Upalakshana. A little bit of this dialectical, hermeneutical things will be uh, quite uh, intellectually rewarding, you know, maybe stimulating. So Upalakshana and Visheshana. I can, only, I can first give example that makes it very clear. Suppose uh, you, uh, you are making a statement, suppose you want to tell somebody if somebody asks you the question, where is this man's home? Okay. In the Sanskrit books, you find Devadatta is often used. Devadatta, old old Sanskrit name. In modern times, you can say George. <laughs> you can say, where, where is George's home? Somebody asks you. You can say, well, the house where a crow is sitting in front of the gate, that is George's home, you may say. <laughs> In the Sanskrit books, it is called, you know, Kākopavishta Devadatta Griham. <laughs> that is the that is Sanskrit statement. Devadatta may be very difficult to pronounce in this 21st century America, you know. So, Kākopavishta Devadatta Griham means, Devadatta, you are asking, where is Devadatta's home? Devadatta's home is the house or the home in front of which a crow is sitting. Now, that doesn't help you very much. George's home is the building or the house in front of which there is a crow sitting right now. The crow won't be sitting there after a few minutes. So, you are, by the time you reach there, it doesn't help you. So, it is only Upalakshana. I mean, that, that, that kind of indication as only temporary or relative value, not absolute value. Another one is the Kage Bhyo Dadi Rekshada. This is contraction, that is expansion. You can expand also. So a mother asking the little child, after keeping some Dadi, here means yogurt, which should be kept under sunlight in the morning. It's an old tradition in ancient Vedic times. So a little child 
is asked to sit in front of the mud pot in which this yogurt is kept. Not the American yogurt, but yogurt of the early days, or even today in India, it, it needs uh, exposure to sunlight, you know, for some time. <laughs> so the child is asked by his mother, you sit and make sure that uh, that crows don't come and eat uh, this uh, this yogurt, so you should you should drive it drive the crows away. You know. It means not only crows, some other birds also may come. Some human being may come to steal the, uh, this yogurt. So the child is expected to save safeguard yogurt not only from crows but also from other birds. Maybe. A, a stray dog will come and eat this yogurt. The child should not think, my mother only asked me to protect yogurt from crows. So I should not act. I need not act if a dog is coming, a cat is coming and eating the yogurt. So by indication, it implies the child is expected to safeguard this yogurt, not only from the crows, but also from any other creatures, dogs or human beings also, if they try to steal this yogurt, he should make a sound, he should try to prevent it. So it's an expansion contraction, the Upalakshana. So Ramanuja says, these Upalakshanas are involved in this definition. The other more important one is Visheshana. These two aspects constitute Lakshana. Visheshana is something different. Suppose, Instead of saying, suppose somebody asks you, where is Devadatta's home? Where is George's home? John's home, let us say. Then you say, uh, oh, you are asking for John's home. You know, if you walk a little further, you will find, let's say, a big tree or a field or a well. That's George's home. That's John's home. That description is very helpful because it is not like saying, the, the house in front of which there is a crow, that's George home. No, because that is, that is helpful only to a limited extent. But this is called Visheshana. Suppose instead of saying, a, instead of giving the example of crow sitting in front of the home, you say that's the home in front of which you find a huge tree, mango tree is standing in front of the building. That is the house of George. Then that description is perfectly valid, it is of a permanent nature. Because it's not like crow will not be there after a few minutes, but the well or the tree will be there all the time. Now these are two types of uh, lectionas. So Ramanujas tell you that the description of God as the origin, support and the point of dissolution of the entire cosmos it is a full-flooded description and definition. It is a Visheshana and also an Upalakshana. Whatever you may take, because these two constitute a definition or an indication. This is an indication, clear indication. Because in Shankaracharya system, if you can clearly indicate and define and describe God, that God becomes imperfect and incomplete. Definition is limitation. So you are creating a, a you are creating a, a structure like putting a photo uh, within a frame. The four at four points you have to have a fr frame at bottom and top and both sides. Frames, you know. You are putting the photo within this frame. So it is limited. Like that when you define God when you explain this is a complete indication of God, you are actually seeing God is something that can be defined, described, explained. So that God cannot be infinite. That cannot, God cannot be transcendent. More, in some ways, Kant was with maybe unconscious, unconsciously trying to reach uh, this level of metaphysics in his critique of pure reason when he talks about the noumenon, you know, going beyond the phenomenon noumenon. But then uh, the metaphysical depth is here. So uh, the absolute reality cannot be defined, cannot be explained. 
the spirit, absolute spiritual reality can only be experienced it cannot be defined so you cannot say what is god uh, god is the creator of the world so that you re- you are reducing god into the status of a creatorship and where in vedantic uh, books there are strong arguments put forward in defense of this view advaita it says it implies suppose you define god as the one who created this world then you are in you are implying that that god has some desire he wants to do something he is in need of something he is wanting something he is lacking something that's why he is creating this world if you if you if you listen to some of the interesting arguments between atheists and the great theologians in which the great theologians routinely get completely and absolutely defeated by the atheists whether it's Joe Dawkins or uh, Christopher Hitchens i have never never heard of a single theologian coming victorious from any debate with any of these great humanists with, with the, any of these great thinkers who are all agnostics and in some cases even atheists that's because they are trying to define god who is god god is the creator of this world so god is need of something if you if you are suppose in your home you are making you are your carpenter you are now involved in uh, making uh, let us you are involved in cooking which means you want to cook and you want to eat you are in need of food you are suppose you are involved in carpentry work you are making a table it means you are ma- making a table something that you are in need of either for your use or for selling you are in need of something so you are doing something and you are making something that need makes god limited or finite you cannot say a god who is in need of creating this world as a very wonderful very absolute very infinite transcendental being so shankaracharya says the definition of god indication of god or the absolute reality brahman as a point of origin uh sustenance or support or point of dissolution of this cosmos this world that is that cannot that doesn't amount to a complete indication or definition because the absolute reality cannot be defined as just the creator of this world okay now we can have interaction you are most welcome with the questions okay yeah swami thank you so much for these talks um i was wondering if i could ask you a question from this morning's talk on karma yeah oh yeah most welcome most welcome yeah um did you listen so- did you listen in person or online I listen to it in a Zoom. I don't live in the I live three hours away from San okay. Francisco. Okay, most welcome, most welcome. Please, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you spoke of concordance of karmas coming together. Um, so a person uh, does an action and, and of course there's a cause and effect. Um, but when, begin, when I begin to think of other people's karma connected to mine, and then i start to think of all indeed is brahma brahma then it makes me think that everything that comes into my consciousness is karma for me to either react positively or negatively um as far as realizing god is that correct thinking that's a very very correct thinking if we can think of all that we experience as part of our own spiritual evolution as coming from god then these uh, these conflicts of karma it it will it will it will leave us alone we will be totally untouched by these conflicts if if we can think of everything as one supreme reality including the the unpleasant experiences as well as pleasant experiences as part of the same reality then you are able to look upon all this with an equanimity of mind with mind uh, in perfect equilibrium 
you'll be taught you'll remain totally unaffected by these conflicts or these different experiences that is that in fact, that, in fact that, that's why advaita comes to the rescue in all these areas if we can think of and slowly uh, along with that if you also read some of these books and try to convince ourselves of this reality and slowly you find uh, we at some point you actually find oh after all it is true at the beginning you are taking risk you are uh, taking uh, refuge in vedanta uh, as a possible uh, solution to the to this the bewildering variety of karmas from different corners from different people and then you read you listen to these ideas eventually when when you reach a level of equilibrium of the mind mind become mind is able to look upon both unpleasant and pleasant experiences with the same equanimity then you find it's after all it's a fact as part of this evolution or you will realize eventually after all it is all true that comes to us that's a gradual evolution thank you uh, namaste swami ji namaste namaste you you mentioned earlier that uh, sankhya provided uh, some of the foundational mm-hmm. arguments in vishishta advaita um, even in the gita there is a lot of reference to sankhya yeah so will you be able to spend some time explaining the fundamentals of sankhya in one of your future lectures oh i can do in fact sankhya system of philosophy will be included it is actually vedanta is the first one after that uh, sankhya and yoga both will come go yoga sutras are different but yoga philosophy is separately i can deal with but i want to mention to you something important you know in the gita you find the second chapter is called the sankhya yoga it does nothing to do the sankhya philosophy the sankhya means jnana yoga in this the second chapter of bhagavad gita is named sankhya yoga that sankhya He is not the sankhya of kapila or isra krishna the sankhya means jnana yoga swamiji um could you spell the name of the person that has this um philosophy that's slightly different than um shankaracharya could you spell i think it's damana acharya is that Ra- ramanuja acharya ramanuja Rama. a uh, a m a n u j a ramanuja acharya yeah okay thank you yeah. yeah that's what we are discussing we are being discussing we had advaita sessions from 1st to 43rd 44th then we are now doing ramanuja for the last 10 sessions here yeah. swami well, i i have a question about uh ramanuja's teacher um was uh wrong about advaita from what you said he did he did a, he did not do a good job of explaining advaita <laughs> yeah. I, so, yeah. so my question is yeah. how, how did rakhnuja have any spiritual experience if his teacher was inferior yeah i tell you so it happened so i will tell you a few things about this ramanuja's father passed away after his marriage and he was uh, he was a very compassionate kind hearted person who respected all teachers and even during the time when he was living in his home with his family he had shown his prodigious scholarship and also his humanistic attitude towards people and things but then after his father pa- passed away father was a scholar and he was teaching under his he was studying uh, all these scriptures under his father but father passed away then uh, his relatives and others suggested to him to move to a nearby town and that town is perhaps in kanchipuram which used to be an ancient center of one of the ancient centers of learning in india you know one of the in ancient india is one of the centers of learning so he moved to kanchipuram and there he started learning under a great well known scholar and his name was yadav prakash and yadav prakash was a staunch advaiti but uh, yadav prakash has written something on advaita which doesn't actually correctly reflect 
the original teachings of Shankaracharya. There are some conflicting points. But you know, I see he was a great scholar. He wrote books, naturally. So Ramanuja didn't agree with his interpretation. So Ramanuja left him, and then he uh, also he went to some other near, nearby places, and he continued his studies under some other teachers who were uh, more, uh, I mean, agreeable to his own views. Uh, but eventually he uh, moved away from Advaita. Actually, he was never very, uh, very comfortable with Advaita, even when he was studying. So he had a lot of controversial arguments with his teacher, so he left. To remember, so he was, you have to remember, he was learning the scriptures. He was perhaps not spiritual preceptor, he was just teacher. Like going to university, you may learn physics from different universities. Like that he was learning from a well-known scholar. And he was perhaps not a very advanced person spiritually, Yadav Prakasha his first teacher. Then he went to other teachers and eventually he learned from other and eventually he learned uh, not only uh, the uh, Sanskrit scriptures but also the uh, the teachings of the Alvars who, 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 whose teachings were recorded in that in the Vilnan Book and Alaira Prabhantas, you know. So, which became, which he accepted uh, with the equal respect and reverence. So Ramanuja, in a way, he harmonized the teachings of the local devotee saints uh, who had recorded their teachings in Tamil language. And he harmonized them with uh, the teachings of the Upanishads and Puranas, by Vishnu Purana and other books. So that was his great work. Okay, that's all. Thank you, sir. Eventually he went to Srirangam and there he lived the rest of his lifetime before his uh, flight to Melkote due to uh, the persecution of a Saivai king. That's the story. Yeah. Maharaj, a uh, very basic question. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, Advaita or uh, Shankaracharya talk about the multiple lokas? Uh, in, in, in between births, where does the Atma reside? The Puranas talk about various Lokas and maybe that is more tied to the Vishishtha Advaita. They emphasize a lot on multiple Lokas and Puranas. So, where do you think the Atmas reside between births? Yeah. You know, Shankaracharya doesn't pay much attention to the, uh, the descriptions of these Lokas. He may have mentioned here and there, but he doesn't uh, consider this as a very important thing to describe. And remember, one important principle that, is that perhaps was established by Shankaracharya, that is, there are three layers of our canonical literature, Vedanta and Indian philosophy, Indian philosophy. The highest and most authentic, the Upanishads, called Sutis. The lowest are Puranas, mythological books. In between there are Smurdis, which are mostly uh, books of law and how to practice Vaidika Dharma, Vedic uh, culture in different times in society, in social circles, individual level, family level and so on. So actually, you know, Ramanuja gave a lot of importance to Vishnu Purana. Uh, he himself wrote the Vaikuntha Kidya, there is a Loka, there is a world called Vaikuntha where Vishnu is living there when you, when, that's why I told you earlier, very, it's very similar in, in some ways, in many ways, very similar to the Christian um, concept of going to heaven and living in close proximity with God, Father in heaven, very similar, there are many striking similarities. So Ramanuja's system is considered to be more of a theology than a philosophy. Yes. It's a theology. God is very important, religion is an integral part, it's central to Ramanuja system. In Shankaracharya system, God is there, it's very important, but it is as metaphysical, as philosophical as it is religious. It's not mere theology. So, these lokas and these different uh, 
all the i do those shankaracharya doesn't consider it worthwhile to discuss those things he is busy with the upanishad the great statement the upanishads <laughs> so he, i think he, he was very busy man you know 32 years and uh, for traveling all over india four times starting no less than 10 monastic orders writing all the most profound sanskrit books and with the most profound sanskrit devotional poetry more, almost 100 of them and then um, uh, starting four monasteries in four di- distant corners of indian subcontinent <laughs> so i don't think he would have bothered much about the puranas you know <laughs> Those say Puranas are not insignificant. Puranas do tell you a story. They have wonderful, mag- magnificent stories in Puranas. But Puranas also uh, uh, talk about things which, uh, which may not make sense. So they do have a value. Okay, they, have it, they do. But there are there stories of demons and all kinds of people, people, demons with uh, with five hundred hands and ten. heads and things like this i think shankaracharya would not have uh, both uh, considered them as worthy of much attention and contemplation you know that's it yeah, that's what it appears to be okay thank you om shanti 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 hari hi om tat sat shri ram krishna arpanamastu om